Good morning. The Senate Judiciary Committee will come to order. Uh, members, uh, today is Friday, March 3rd, 2023. We do have a quorum present. Um, and uh, before we get started on our agenda, I, I do want to note um, there was a, uh, a request that today's hearing be conducted in, as a hybrid hearing. Um, unfortunately, the request came in uh, too late for us to be able to make the technical or technological accommodations uh, for that. Um, there's actually a lot of back scene, behind the scenes work that goes to setting up a hybrid hearing so that members can participate remotely um, as well as facilitating all the other uh, aspects of it. So um, uh, I have no problem at all allowing and, and providing for hybrid hearings as long as we have the request early enough that the staff can make it happen. Um, but the request came in late yesterday and it just wasn't time to do it for today. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator Pappas. Yeah, I think that some of us have been caught off guard by that, but it's my understanding we need a 24-hour notice. Uh, yes, uh, Senator Pappas. The Senate rules do require 24 hours. Um, and uh, um, everyone should understand we are going to be having hearings on Fridays. So if you have to schedule something not to be physically present here in committee on a Friday. Um, I understand we all have busy schedules, uh, but please, if you want to be hybrid, let us know as far in advance as you can, at least 24 hours in advance. I would assume you're, if you're scheduling things, you're doing it more than the 24 hours in advance, so you know ahead of time, so we can uh, make the accommodation. I want to make this as participatory as possible, um, but uh, we have to do it within our, our means as well. Uh, so, Senator Limmer. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I'm uh, a little disappointed that we didn't have a hybrid uh, status on this meeting. Uh, I believe yesterday, uh, at least a conversation I had with one of our other members, they had talked with your staff and they thought that there would be a hybrid hearing today. And so uh, they continued kind of balancing different responsibilities today uh, back in their home district. Uh, we actually have two members that were under that impression, but uh, I understand the rules that you have to uh, run by and the confusion that may have occurred, but we'll uh, we'll all try and uh, work a little better next time. Thank you, Senator Lemarine, and I'm not trying to be an unnecessary enforcer of the rules. Um, it's just that there there is a lot of behind the scenes work that needs to be done just to set it up technologically, and so um, if we have enough time to do it. We certainly will do it, even if it's not exactly 24 hours ahead of time. Um, but uh, uh, so I guess enough said on that. We'll do everything we can, but members should assume we're going to be meeting on Fridays and should uh, set their schedules accordingly. And if they want to put in a request for hybrid hearing, we will accommodate that as long as we can physically accomplish that. Um, we do uh, have a long agenda today. What we are going to do is meet until noon. And whenever we get a convenient break point around noon, we'll take 30 minute break so members have a chance to, uh, to eat lunch um, and do whatever else they, they uh, want to do, return calls or whatever they need to uh, during that break. And then uh, we'll be back on 30 minutes after we take that break to complete the agenda. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping, anticipating that we can be out of here in a reasonable period of time, but we're gonna do the work that we need to do to get the stuff done right. So with that, we're going to start with Senate File 6. This is Senator Port's uh, bill on uh, price gouging. Senator Port is uh, chairing her own committee at this time, and Senator Klein, uh, chair of the Commerce Committee that uh, this bill is coming to us from, uh, who I understand is also a co-author on the bill. Um, well, I know is. I can see the bill in front of me. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, presenting the bill. So Senator Klein, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee, for hearing Senate File 6. This actually is my first ever visit in my life to the Judiciary Committee. Um, no further comment on that. But uh, today I am prepared to pinch hit for Senator Port on price gouging. Senate File 6 establishes that during times of abnormal market disruption, which requires a declaration of a state of emergency by the governor, selling or offering to sell an essential consumer good or service at an unconscionably excessive price is illegal. 
and the unconscionably, excess, unconscionably excessive price is more than 25% above the seller's average price of an essential good or service offered in the normal course of business in the 60-day period before the abnormal market disruption. When the governor declares an emergency, the governor's emergency declaration must specify the geographical area of Minnesota to which the de declaration applies. It also requires both the governor and the Department of Commerce to notify the public of the emergency declaration and the prohibition. Draw members' attention to section 2, page 2.1 to sec 2.8, which was worked out with the retail industry to define what price gouging is not and create some protections for them. Uh, price gouging is not a price related to an increase in the cost of manufacturing, obtaining, replacing, providing, or selling a good or service. It is not a price that is no more than 25% above the seller's average price during the 60-day period before the market disruption. It is, a price, it is not a price that is consistent with fluctuations in applicable commodity markets or seasonal fluctuations. And it is not a contract price or the results of a price formula that was established before an abnormal market disruption. The bill provides that the Attorney General may investigate and bring an action against a seller for an unconscionably excessive price during the time of emergency. Violators can be fined up to $1,000 per sale with a maximum pen penalty of $25,000 per day, along with damages through the private right of action established in the bill. The declaration is terminated 30 days after the date that the state of emergency for which it was activated ends. This bill also creates a new section of law in Minnesota's consumer protection statutes called the Act Regulating Price Gouging. Mr. Chair, that's a brief summary of the bill, and I do have two testifiers today. Why don't we have the testifiers both come forward and take the seats on either side of Senator Klein. Mr. Newstead, I have you listed on my list as the first testifier. Would you like to go ahead? Please do, Mr. Newstead. Identify yourself for the record and tell us what you have to say. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bruce Newstead with the Minnesota Retailers Association. I work with uh, retailers across the state. About a third of those retailers are what you consider Main Street family-owned retailers. About a third are regional retailers, and about a third are national retailers. We've had a great pleasure working uh, with uh, Chair Port and others on this bill, and actually Chair Klein did a fantastic job explaining uh, some of the really solid parts of this bill, as Chair Klein mentioned, one of the benefits of this bill for not only retailers, but also suppliers, manufacturers, consumers, and regulators. The bill does a good job describing what price gouging is not, effectively creating a, a standard that people can understand uh, in, in a time of crisis, unfortunately. Uh, as with all bills, there's always a couple things we'd love to see continue to be worked on. Uh, as Chair Klein mentioned, the bill automatically continues for 30 days after a, uh, it's invoked. Uh, there may be a benefit at some point to having the governor have that uh, stay on for less time. Think of last week's snowstorm. Uh, the governor activated the National Guard, so he declared a state of peacetime emergency. Uh, he may, had he wanted to invoke this for any reason, it might have been uh, good for him to have the flexibility of uh, cutting down the time to 15 days or five days, whatever that would be. So we'd offer that for some future consideration, as well as uh, this bill actually has the governor do a good job to notify folks that the price gouging statute's been put in place. We think on the back end, it'd be good to have the attorney general uh, let folks know when investigations are complete or the status of investigations as well. But I'll turn my attention just to the purview of the committee today. Uh, we're certainly uh, concerned with uh, the private right of action uh, in the bill and the penalties. The penalties are fairly high and from my non-lawyer look at things, uh, fairly out of line with what other states with price gouging statutes have. Uh, in addition, kind of a cursory review of our kind of main three consumer protection laws here uh, this language looks considerably different from what we see in those uh, pieces as well. Um, so we'd, we'd love to see some uh, kind of just more alignment uh, with what makes sense. And really, honestly, our, our purpose of kind of thinking about that is how do we protect those that may have made uh, inadvertent mistake uh, and got caught up in this versus how do we address those that are truly functioning as bad actors. And I, I'm convinced there's a way to do that, um, but this kind of private right of action and penalty uh, slash damages language probably isn't quite the right way yet, and we hope the committee will continue to look at that. Mr. Chair, I know you and Vice Chair Seberger and Chair Klein all had a conversation uh, slightly about
about this area in commerce uh, last week, and so we hope you have some good conversation on private right of action and penalties today. But I just again want to end with a deep appreciation for the thoughtfulness of went into kind of the structure of the bill. You know, Minnesota businesses uh, are committed to doing the right thing and doing the right thing during the time of emergency. We should make sure this uh, law and its penalties and enforcement is enforced by the Attorney General, which would have the professionals uh, available and can interpret the law in a way. I'll go back to creating the expectations for retailers, wholesalers, suppliers, manufacturing, manufacturers and consumers. It's important that there be kind of that one entity to enforce this bill and enforce it in a consistent manner. So with that, Mr. Chair, thanks for the time to testify today. I deeply appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Newstead. Next on our testifier list is Tyler Blackman. Mr. Blackman, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Latz, uh, members of the committee. My name is Tyler Blackman. I'm a second year law student at the University of Minnesota Law School, uh, where I focus um, my studies on consumer protection issues like the one before you today. And I'm here to urge you to vote yes uh, in favor of this bill um, as amended for, for several reasons. Um, first, just as some background, uh, Minnesota is rapidly becoming an outlier nationally as a state that does not currently protect its consumers against price gouging. 38 states and the District of Columbia all um, have a specific price gouging bill uh, legislation, and of the 12 that do not, many um, are actually considering changing that now after what we just witnessed during the pandemic. But for the sake of time, I want to focus my attention on what I consider to be the most important part of this bill, and that is the private right of action, which you've heard a little bit about. Um, to craft any effective consumer protection legislation, it's imperative that consumers be able to bring suit to recover for their injuries. We need a private right of action in addition to civil penalties for a number of reasons. First, it puts money back into the pockets of the everyday people who were abused by price gouging. If corporations are going to extract money from consumers, those same consumers deserve to recoup the money that was illegally taken from them. Second, the Office of the Attorney General is already stretched thin and cannot possibly bring an action against every single corporation for every single infraction in violation of this law. The private right of action is simply a far more effective enforcement mechanism. Third, a private right of action is the only way, and this is important, it's the only way to ensure a level playing field for small businesses and large corporations. To a small business, the civil penalty in this bill is substantial, which means it's doing its job. It's acting as a strong deterrent to defrauding consumers. But to a large corporation, a civil penalty doesn't do its job. If you're choosing between a $25,000 fine and making millions of dollars as a large corporation by price gouging consumers, of course you're going to choose to just pay the fine. So if you don't include a private right of action, you're basically saying that only small businesses have to follow this law. That's not fair. Finally, including a private right of action is in line with what this body has done with past consumer protection bills. Senators, if you look at the first page of this bill, um, you'll see that this also amends Minnesota Statute 8.31, uh, which is what's known as the Private Attorney General Act. If you're unfamiliar with that act, it essentially grants a private right of action uh, to a host of consumer protection acts across the code to help the Attorney General make sure that the law is enforced and allow consumers to recover money directly. What's convenient for all of you is that at the top of the bill here is a handy list of all the other consumer protection acts, like the price gouging bill, that already include a private right of action. And things like the Unlawful Trade Practices Act, the Antitrust Act, Anti-Discrimination in uh, False and Fraudulent Advertising. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. It's the standard uh, for us to include a private right of action when we have a consumer protection bill. And many of these, including the Antitrust Act, also include treble damages. Uh, so it would actually be quite strange in this case to not include a private right of action. It would be a departure from our usual custom of including the private right of action in consumer protection legislation. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them on this topic, but otherwise I urge a vote, a vote yes on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blackman. Uh, are there any members of the public in the room that would like to testify in connection with this bill? All right, I don't see any. We're going to open up the floor for discussion uh, by members of the committee. Any questions or comments from members of the committee? Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, once again, I'm might be a recurring theme here, um, sticking up for small businesses today. Um, I think this is an incredibly punitive statute for small businesses. Um, there was testimony about the uh, 
the damages provisions and the civil penalty and the private right of action. And um, I heard some interesting testimony um, as the uh, private right of action is a, is a way to create a level playing field for small businesses. Um, I found that to be a very interesting comment because the way this works is we're talking about small businesses here, mom and pa corporations, mom and pa associations, uh, small groups of people owning businesses. Um, the private right of action would allow the trial lawyers to um, start a lawsuit against a small business for any infraction that they perceive. And um, unlike a big corporation who could litigate against these trial lawyers, uh, if they are in the right and they did not have, didn't feel they violated the statutes, a lot of these small businesses are not in a similar situation. And they will be presented with a settlement offer and they'll be in a very difficult position of having to choose to pay money in that settlement, even if they strongly believe they didn't violate the law, because the alternative would be litigating, which could put many of these small businesses out of business. Um, a lot of big corporations don't face that same um, threat, and if they don't feel they violated the law, they will litigate against the trial lawyers. And the trial lawyers will then naturally gravitate towards going after the small businesses. So the idea that the private right of action creates, is a, creates a level playing field is absurd. Um, I think the civil penalties would be more than enough to um, ensure compliance with this, with this statute. And just for some context here, for anybody who happens to be watching, we, we heard phrases like uh, corporations abusing consumers, and we heard you know, corporations making millions of dollars through price gouging. Um, during um, our last stint here during the pandemic where we had empty store shelves and people making runs on products, um, a lot of consumers naturally associated that with price gouging, even though there was very little price gouging actually going on. We had 2,400, the Attorney General's office, according to their own numbers, opened up uh, over 2,400 cases of price gouging based on consumer complaints. Of those 2,400, only 100 ended up in resolutions with only six formal actions. So, again, this idea that during the biggest pandemic of our lifetime was some of the most um, unusual economic circumstances, that's, those are the numbers relating to that. So I, I think creating this kind of punitive structure in this bill is an overreach. The other concern I have here is, um, relating to the investigations. A consumer, the, the attorney general advertises, basically invites people to report instances of what they perceive to be price gouging and encourage them to um, file a complaint with the attorney general's office. And a lot of consumers, like I said before, will naturally assume that when they see a price spike in a certain situation that it is price gouging. And we can have the best definition in the world in this statute about what, is not pri what isn't price gouging. That isn't going to mean that the consumer isn't going to think it's price gouging. And it doesn't mean they're not going to uh, file a complaint with the Attorney General's office when they see um, a significant price increase on a product that has nothing to do with price gouging. And so what happens with Ma and Pa companies out in greater Minnesota or here in the Twin Cities, a lot of them um, uh, a lot of them in the Twin Cities, a lot of them uh, immigrants that are operating these businesses, they don't have staff to get the documentation, to get all the necessary paperwork that the Attorney General is going to require of them to respond to these accusations of price gouging. Um, and they have to do it themselves, the owners, and they, they'll do that on nights, they'll do that on weekends. And it's an incredible, incredible burden on them when a very, very small percentage of these cases actually have anything to do with price gouging. 
And then they're notified by the Attorney General that they're under investigation And, or it gets around, they may not even be notified, but it gets around town. People know that they're under investigation for price gouging, and then it just lingers out there. There's no mechanism for any closure for the small business so that they can tell their community, this could be in a, a town of 500 people, so they can go out and tell their community that they didn't do anything wrong. And they've got the stigma of price gouging sitting over their head indefinitely. And so I hope we can at least agree even if we can't agree on, on kind of the punitive aspect of this, that there should be some protections in place for small businesses to um, have some closure when one of their consumers levels an accusation of price gouging against them so that they can go out into their community and say that there isn't an investigation anymore. And so to that end, I'll offer the A7 amendment. The amendment has now been distributed to the committee as being made available in the back for members of the public. Senator Kroon, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what my A7 amendment does, um, it's in uh, part of the um, subdivision six, which is on lines, uh, on page three, lines uh, 13 through 14. And after that section, what it does is it um, it says, if the Attorney General investigates a violation of this section, the Attorney General must, one, promptly notify the seller that they are the subject of an investigation, and two, notify the seller when the investigation closes. The intent of this is for these small businesses to have some closures, because if we end up in another emergency situation, and there are runs on products, and, and there are supply chain issues, and all sorts of things that are beyond the retailer's control, and prices go up, there are gonna be complaints from consumers of price gouging, even when there is no price gouging going on. That's just what happens. And this would at least, at a minimum, give these retailers, these small businesses, some closure that the investigation is no longer ongoing. And, um, and they can tell their community and they can tell their customers that yes, there was an investigation, and yes, it's no longer, uh, it's closed, and uh, there's been no action taken against us. And they can at least hold their head up high in their communities and not have this hanging over them indefinitely. I think it's a very small gesture in the grand scheme of things, one that um, is reasonable. It's a reasonable compromise, and it's one I hope that we can all get behind. Thank you. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair and Senator Kroon, so apart from the A7, Senator Kroon made several concerns, raised several concerns about the bill, and at, at the right moment, I'd like the opportunity to speak to each one of them. I've got four itemized. Specific to the A7, uh, first of all, I, I would be interested if the wisdom of the committee might consider splitting this amendment. Honestly, I think the provision to promptly notify the seller that they are the subject of an investigation has some merit. Um, the Attorney General's office isn't here uh, today, but they did inform me that they have significant concerns about the notification when the investigation closes. Um, specifically, they say um, 
A attorney General's office typically does not provide investigative targets with status updates or formal notice that an investigation is closed. Um, it would be administratively burdensome to do so. It would inevitably result in targets either misconstruing or intentionally misusing such notice to claim the Attorney General Office approves of their conduct or found that they are compliant with the law when in reality the Attorney General Office may or may not exercise its discretionary enforcement authority for a number of different reasons. And finally, there may be a need for future investigation in the future upon receipt of additional information. So for those reasons, as written, I would oppose the A7, um, but I would be interested in the opinion of the committee about splitting the amendment. Senator Kroon, did you wish to respond? And then I've got some thoughts as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, appreciate the comments. Um, I would just, in response to that, I would say that these investigations from the Attorney General are different than a typical investigation. I understand that the Attorney General typically doesn't comment on investigations and they're not going to publicly declare um, that an investigation is closed, but these are publicly initiated investigations. They are the Attorney General going out into the public and encouraging people to file these complaints with their office. And so that's fundamentally different than the Attorney General on their own volition going out and quietly starting an investigation against somebody. These are public declarations, uh, you know, inviting these public complaints to come in. And so I think it's different from that standpoint. And so in these situations, I do think that the um, the seller, the retailer, should have an opportunity to know when that investigation is no longer ongoing. Um, you mentioned the administrative burden. I can appreciate the administrative burden on the Attorney General's office, but when you compare that to the administrative burden to these small businesses, I don't think, um, I think the Attorney General can e much more easily bear the administrative burden in notifying these sellers that an investigation is no longer ongoing than the administrative burden for these mom and pa small businesses um, to comply with the, 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 the requests and the documentation requests, and then to have that hanging over them. So uh, I do acknowledge there would be administrative burden, but comparatively speaking, I think it's less than the administrative burden the, the small businesses uh, uh, incur. On the, on the final point I would make is, with regard to future investigations, there's nothing in this amendment that would prohibit the Attorney General from reopening an investigation or starting a new investigation based on a new claim. Nothing in this amendment would prohibit that. And, um, and so, you know, could there be a small business owner that might tout uh, that the investigation is no longer ongoing and use that as proof that they didn't do anything wrong, which we, we know isn't necessarily the case. It may just be that the Attorney General didn't have sufficient evidence or whatever. Yeah, that could happen. Um, my response is, so what? You know, that, that's, you know, that's how people operate. The, the, the notice wouldn't be that. The letter that they would get wouldn't say, you've been cleared. If they want to misrepresent that, that's on them. That's on the small business owners. I hope they wouldn't do that, and I don't think they would do that but I don't think that's a reason from denying them the opportunity to get notice when the investigation is no longer ongoing. Thank you. Uh, so, Senator Kroon, I, I have, I'm quite sympathetic to this situation, but I do have a question or two uh, for you. Do you know of any other statute in Minnesota that, uh, has a similar provision in it that, uh, relating to an attorney general investigation or Department of Commerce investigation or anything like that where there's some kind of requirement that if an investigation is opened that there be a notice provided that it's been closed? Senator Crum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have not researched. Um, I do think that there are, um, just in my experience in small business, that Typically, if there's, I, I shouldn't speak to this because I haven't researched, but but I believe if and there's an investigation on wage and hour, that kind of stuff, I believe the employer is notified of a resolution um, of that investigation in some way, shape, or form. I don't have the details on that, so I don't want to say anything definitively. Um, but again, 
this is not um, a typical investigation from the Attorney General's office, and it's a, a more public um, situation, so that would be what would differentiate this from the typical um, investigation. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm trying to evaluate the two different provisions in here independently. Um, from what I understand, I guess I got this from the Hearing and Commerce Committee uh, that Senator Klein chaired and, and, and on which I serve, um, the Attorney General's office received about 2,400 complaints. Um, and some of the complaints, I think they looked at the letter, they evaluated it, determined there wasn't enough to go forward with at all. I mean, not even to the point of investigating or requesting information from the business that was the subject of the complaint, and they just closed it. Um, and so one question for me would be whether under those circumstances, I mean, technically they opened an investigation, I guess. They were the, they were the subject of an investigation. So the burden would then be on the Attorney General's office to say send out 2,000 letters to say uh, we received a complaint, we took a look at it, we are declining to pursue the investigation any further than reviewing the initial letter of complaint and our investigation at present is closed. Um, and so, you know, that, that's one analysis. Um, the, the second, on the other hand, you know, obviously if, if there's a request for information to the business, they know they're the subject of an investigation, so there wouldn't need to be any other formal notice. I suppose the request would come with, we've received a complaint. A letter that says, we've received a complaint about this, we're investigating, please send us the following information so we can make a determination. Uh, at that point, they're clearly on notice. And I don't recall the numbers uh, from the Commerce Committee. I think that was more in the nature of 400. Um, I know there were only six formal uh, actions that were resolved, but um, that doesn't uh, necessarily mean uh, that uh, there weren't other investigations that were resolved some short of formal uh, enforcement or, or discontinuance actions. Um, I am a bit concerned about the issue of, of a business going out in the community and waving the letter out and saying, uh, we've been absolved. Um, and your own comment, Senator Kroon, kind of raised that point for me because you said they want to go out in the community and say, hold their head up high. Um, which is another way of saying, look, the AG's office has stopped investigating, so we must have been absolved. It's the same way in which a criminal defendant who gets acquitted goes out and says, this means that I'm innocent. And it doesn't. It just means that a jury has decided that there was enough burden, or that the state had not met their burden of proof to convict, so they're called acquittal. That's why it's an acquittal, not a finding of innocence in the, uh, in the criminal scene. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind businesses will go out and say, uh, Attorney General has determined there's nothing further to investigate. We're closing the investigation. That means I did nothing wrong, and it may not mean that at all. Um, on the other hand, I am sympathetic to the desire of businesses that know they're under investigation for closure so that they don't go on for six months worried every night that their business is still under investigation and they could get a letter the next day by certified mail saying we're bringing a formal action against you and you're subject to penalties that could be this, that, and the other thing, and all of a sudden it's a whole different uh, situation for them. Uh, so I'm kind of struggling uh, with this. I'm, I'm sympathetic actually to both. Um, despite the administrative burden on the Attorney General's office, and I got the same email that Senator Klein was referring to from the Attorney General's office explaining why they think that or why they assert that there are disadvantages to uh, providing notices. Uh, one is the administrative burden. Um, <clears throat> and I'm thinking back, and well, there, I know that there are other situations, certainly in professional boards, where complaints are made and uh, they may get rejected out of hand, but I still think there's a notice that goes out to the subject of the complaint that we received. The board received a notice. Uh, we've reviewed it. We're, we're not doing anything about it. Um, and just kind of let you know that happened. I don't recall exactly if that's the case, and maybe council can recall it and take a look for me, but I think that's the case. 
Um, but honestly, I, I <clears throat> the Attorney General's office has administrative authority to do an investigation. I think they can probably figure out how to send out a letter that says, we received a complaint, we're taking no action. Um, on the other hand, I would want some language in there that says, by taking no action, we do not mean to <laughs> suggest that you are absolved of all wrongdoing. Um, and you can't use this letter to say that. Um, another provision they, uh, they explained as a reason for not sending out such a notice was exactly that. They don't want such a notice to be misconstrued um, intentionally or not to suggest that the Attorney General's office approves of their conduct or that they've been found to be in compliant in the law when in reality they may simply may exercise their discretionary authority to not pursue it. It may, frankly, it may just be too small, given the amount of resources necessary to investigate, to merit the follow-up. Um, and, uh, and the final reason that the Attorney General's office says there may be a need for future investigation um, upon the receipt of additional information, well, I, frankly, that's true. But to me, that doesn't mean you shouldn't let them know that at least for now the uh, investigation is closed unless we learn something more or don't plan to pursue anything. And that could be a part of the letter of closure as well. So uh, honestly, I, I don't find the Attorney General's uh, justifications or suggestions that, uh, that there should be no follow-up letter persuasive. Not to me, anyway. Uh, so I'm inclined to support the amendment, but I've got a suggestion that I've asked council to draft up at least that might put a little clarity in here. Uh, so uh, maybe I can ask council primo to suggest it and, and then we'll ask for if there's any other comments from members of the committee or feedback on it from Senator Klein and, and so on. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, looking at the A7, page one, line four, after the period, insert a notice issued by the Attorney General notifying the seller that an investigation has closed is not a determination on the merits of an investigation, period. So I'd be interested in feedback from the author of the amendment and also from Senator Klein and, of course, anyone else on the committee that has thoughts on it. Senator Cronin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, and I assumed that the Attorney General would put all of those things in the letter. Um, I didn't put the, that into the drafting of the amendment, um, but it, my amendment wouldn't foreclose the Attorney General from including that information in the letter. Having said that, I think the additional language that you are proposing in the amendment to the amendment is factual. Um, it's something they would put in the letter anyway. And so I would accept that as a friendly amendment to the amendment. Senator Klein, what are your thoughts on that? Mr. Chair and Senator Kroon, uh, I also would think that would be a reasonable improvement to the A7. One concern, the behavior that you were concerned about was that the retailer then would sort of use this attorney general notification um, as a public proclamation of innocence. Uh, even with your additional language, that behavior would still be possible. Um, so uh, I don't know that it accomplishes everything you're trying to accomplish, but I think it is an improvement on the original. Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, I, and I didn't mean to be flippant about when I said so what before in response to that. I, but Senator Latz brought up um, you know, a defendant in a, in a criminal case getting a judgment of acquittal, and, and then we all know that that doesn't necessarily mean they're innocent of the crime. <clears throat> um, but some defendants do go out into the community with that judgment of acquittal, and they say, see, I'm innocent. I was proven innocent. And we know that that's not actually true, but they do it anyway. But we would never deprive that <laughs> criminal defendant of that judgment of acquittal because they might misuse that judgment and go out and misconstrue what it may or may not mean. And so I guess that's my response to that argument. Thanks. 
Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if we could include in the amendment something, some additional language that says this may notice may not be used to suggest. I think that gets a little prescriptive in a state statute uh, from that standpoint. But uh, I suspect if, if the Attorney General, if someone went out and did that, it might pique the Attorney General's interest <laughs> um, and it might prompt a counter a response uh, to the local media that says, hey, we, <laughs> that's not what we were saying. We just declined to pursue the investigation, but maybe we should look more deeply into it. I'm not sure someone would want to prompt the Attorney General's office to take that further step. Um, any, uh, and I'm not, the other ambiguity, I guess, that this brought up when it was in commerce is, you know, what constitutes an investigation? You know, if the Attorney General's office looks at a letter of complaint and says there's no merit here or not enough for us to go forward on, is that an investigation or is that simply a review and a decline to pursue it? Um, I'm not sure if we want to get that prescriptive in statute either, so probably a default position the Attorney General's office could take that would be a judgment call on each one. Is this investigation or not? Um, whether they think they have to send out a notice because they looked at a letter and said uh, there's not enough here to, to go any further with, so we're not going to send any kind of a notice out. And it shouldn't really matter to the local uh, business that they, we looked at it and, and are doing nothing. Um, uh, but I guess I'm inclined to leave that level of, of nuance up to the investigating authority. I'm not familiar either that, um, uh, you know, say, county attorney's office is that they open up a criminal investigation, how often they actually follow up and, and tell the subject of the investigation, we're not going to go any further with this. But, uh, you know, there's just a notice in, in the national headlines that uh, um, a defense attorney was notified uh, that their client was uh, not going to be subject to any further investigation. And, I can only imagine what it's like if you know you're being under, you're investigated, and you never find out what the, uh, you know, what the investigating agency is going to do with it. Even if they've made a decision and they've closed their file, you may never know. Um, I'm not comfortable with that notion either. Um, any other members of the committee have any comments or thoughts on this? I'm not seeing any. Um, so as chair, I can't formally make a motion to amend your amendment, Senator Kroon, but if you were to make a motion to incorporate that additional language into your own amendment, uh, I don't do we need a formal vote on such a motion or can Senator Kroon just incorporate it on his own? Okay, I'm, I'm advised by counsel Senator Kroon can just incorporate this language on his own if he wishes to do so. Unless Senator Limmer would like to participate and make a motion, then we can do that. <laughs> After careful consideration, Mr. Chairman, uh, so moved. All right, Senator Limmer moves to add the language that council drafted. Um, does anyone need to have that language reread? Um, Ms. Primo, could you reread the language for the amendment to the amendment? Mr. Chair and members, page one, line four, after the period, insert. <coughs> A notice issued by the Attorney General notifying the seller that an investigation has closed is not a determination on the merits of an investigation. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Um, I also suppose the Attorney General's office could look at a letter and say, we've looked send out a notice after the fact saying we received a letter, we looked at it, or a complaint, we looked at it, we determined we're not going to pursue an investigation at this time. Um, and so that's the end of our investigation into your business. Um, they'd be wise to add a, le a line at the end that says, also, if we receive further information, we could reopen our investigation. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I guess that would be at their discretion as well. Um, is there any further discussion um, on uh, Senate File 6. Senator Carlson. Oh, I'm sorry. We haven't addressed the underlying A7 amendment. So I'm going to back up and then we'll come to you, Senator Carlson. Is there any further discussion on the A7 amendment as amended? I'm not seeing any. 
So, uh, Senator Klein, any further thoughts on the amendment as amended? Uh, you had mentioned some earlier concerns about how it was set up um, in terms of uh, paragraph or, or clause one and clause two. Did you want to pursue anything further with that at this time, or what would you like to do? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll drop those concerns about dividing the amendment uh, since it seems that the, the spirit of the committee is receptive to this. I, I, would, I would simply sort of, uh, as standing in for the Attorney General's office, uh, kind of restate that I think they would have concerns about this amendment. They do not feel that it will strengthen their hand uh, in being effective uh, in combating price gouging, uh, and they would encourage the committee to vote it down. All right. Any for Senator Kroon? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is the Zoom option ready now? Did we have word on that? Um, I don't know uh, if uh, the hybrid option is not being used today, so uh, maybe I should explain for the public the difference here. Um, when we do a hybrid version, um, we have the committee on teams, I believe it is, which means uh, we can part we can participate um, uh, just amongst ourselves, but it's not that part is not being broadcast uh, publicly. But Zoom enables members of the public to participate um, and to follow along. Um, but that way, the, the committee's participation in the hearing, which ends up being rebroadcast on Zoom, um, is not subject to being hacked or uh, from any members of the public that would try to come into the team's proceeding. Am I accurate about that? Ms. Rico, or we seem to have lost our momentarily, uh, Ms. Kaplan, on that. Um, so, it, Senator Kroon, do you ask because there's another member of the committee that wished to weigh in on this, or uh, is there some other reason? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that, that was the reason I asked. But if it's not um, if it's not possible for them to participate, then I would just move on to the vote. Thank you. Uh, so, did Senator Seeberger, I'm, I'm being informed that you wish to say something. Is that the case or not? Not on this amendment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then I'm not seeing any further committee discussion on Senator Cruin's A7 amendment as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The amendment prevails and is the motion prevails, the amendment's adopted. Is there any further discussion on Senate File uh, 6 as amended? Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Kroon spoke briefly on the issue of the private right of action, and I would like to echo those concerns. Um, I'm not convinced that a private right of action is the way to go with this bill, um, but if the body feels differently about that, then I think we need to look at what exactly this private right of action is. In looking at line 3.17, this provides a person who purports to be aggrieved the right to receive three times the actual damages sustained together with costs and disbursements, including reasonable attorney's fees. And I know I've made this argument before and my position on the American rule has not changed. Um, I would like to see the entire subdivision seven stricken, but if it remains in, um, I would like to see uh, a period after the word action in 3.17, but if that's going to st not acceptable, then at the very least we need to change shall to may. I don't think that um, it's equitable or just or reasonable to mandate that a court, upon a finding that a party has been aggrieved, that they must award three times the actual damages and the costs and disbursements and attorney's fees. I think that's outrageous. Um, and this language in its current form, I do not support. Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and this concern was raised in, the, in my committee as well in commerce and um, consumer protection, and I think uh, had some receptive uh, 
members as well. Uh, Senator Seberger certainly can offer an amendment in any form uh, she wishes. I will say available to the committee uh, in front of you is the A3, uh, which would make the change on line three, page three, line 17, described by Senator Seberger, which would delete shall and insert may. And if that amendment is not in members' packets, perhaps the pages could distribute. So to the points raised by Senator Seberger, um, we don't have a formal amendment. Senator Seberger, are you, are you proposing to offer the amendment that Senator Klein uh, just referenced. Looks like staff is ready to hand it out, but I'm not sure if you actually asked for it. Let me take a look at it, and I can answer your question. Yes. Don't hand it out quite yet. And if it's offered, I'm going to have a suggestion for some minor language modification as well. Mr. Chair. Senator Seberger. As to the A3 amendment, <clears throat> I would propose to amend the language to include the following. So, um, on line 3.17. Well, Senator Seberger, we don't have the, oh. the members don't have the amendment I'm in front sorry. of us yet. So. Um, I thought it was passed Would you out. ask for it to be handed out to the members, and then we can look at the language that you're going to suggest? Okay. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I thought it was being handed out to the members. Looks like it is now. Okay. So it's being handed out, and it'll be made available to the public so everyone can follow along with what we're doing here. So, Senator Seberger, let me suggest procedurally, um, if, if you were to uh, move the A3 amendment, we can have it formally in front of the body. And if you wish to make any additional amendments to the amendment, um, or if anyone else in the committee wishes to do so, we could do that. We'd have the option to divide or not divide an amendment under those circumstances. And then ultimately, you could decide if you wanted to leave the amendment up for a final vote or if you wanted to withdraw the amendment. I think that'll help us procedurally keep track of things. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then at this time, I move the A3 amendment. All right. Senator Seberger moves the A3 amendment. It is now available to the public and to the members of the committee. Senator Seberger, to your amendment. Thank you. The A3 amendment uh, replaces the word shall in line 3.17 with the word may, making the remedies of trouble damages, costs and disbursements, and reasonable, and reasonable attorney's fees permissive rather than mandatory. Um, I think this is a great first step, but I'd like to see it go a little bit further. So I would propose to amend this amendment on line 3.17 to put a period after the word sustained, strike the word together, and on line 3.18, strike the language up until the word fees. So the remedies would be that an aggrieved party may bring a civil action and may recover three times the actual damages sustained. Senator Seberger is proposing to amend the A3 amendment um, by adding after line 1.2 on the amendment language that would have the effect of amending line 3.17 in Senate file six to put a period after the word sustained, to lead everything after that on three point, I'm sorry, 3.17, and delete line 3.18 up to the period. Uh, actually, I think you wouldn't need the period after sustained because we'd leave the period in on 3.18. That would drop back to the end of sustained. 
be the formal way to do it. Did I describe that right, Ms. Primo, Council? Okay. Um, Ms. Primo, why don't you read it? Then we'll have the amendment before us as Senator Seberger would like us to consider. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, page three, line 17, delete comma together. Page three, line 18, delete everything before the period. <coughs> That's why we have council do it. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, Senator Seberger, procedurally, uh, you could simply incorporate your change into your proposed A3 amendment, I believe would be correct, um, if you wish to do so, or we can have a separate discussion on that question. The response after that could be if any member wanted to divide the amendment, they could divide it uh, into uh, into two parts, so we'd have a separate vote or conversation on that. How would you like to proceed, Senator Seberger? It's your amendment. Mr. Chair, I would like to incorporate it into my amendment, um, and then we can talk about it, and I, well, we'll leave it at that for now. Okay, so um, I'm gonna make just a language suggestion for you to consider, since uh, you've already incorporated that, we're not amending an amendment to the amendment. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest, uh, with regard to the language in the original bill, after, on line 3.17, after recover, insert up to. That would uh, clarify that it's not an either or choice, uh, zero or three times, but any place in between would be authorized. <coughs> and then that would leave it to the discretion of the, uh, of the deciding person um, what damages would be they think is appropriate to the facts of the of the case. Senator Siebert, what do you think of that? I think that makes a lot of sense, Mr. Chair. So do you wish to incorporate that into your A3 amendment as you have already amended? Yes, please, I do. Okay. Does council need anything addressed on that point? Okay, so um, what I'm going to All right, so we have the A3 amendment as fully incorporated with some changes by Senator Seberger uh, before us for discussion. Uh, Senator Klein, as the uh, stand-in chief author of the bill before us, what is your view on this proposed amendment? Well, Chair Latz and Senator Seberger, I uh, bow to the wisdom of the uh, many attorneys on the committee and uh, accept the amendment as friendly. Do any other members of the committee have conversation of, about this? Um, Mr. Act, Mr. Chair. Senator Siebert. The reason I think this is a little bit too much and goes a little bit too far is because we have mechanisms within the law to allow a prevailing party to recover costs and disbursements, not attorney's fees, but costs and disbursements if they're successful in an action. Um, we have um, official settlement offers that can go out that have a little bit of teeth in them. If a party does not accept the settlement offer, then they are able to recover, um, I think in the case of plaintiffs, double their costs and attorney's fees. We have these mechanisms available already in the law. We don't need them written into statute. Again, you know how I feel about the American rule and requiring another party to pay um, the opposing party's attorney's fees. For those reasons, I think giving the court discretion to award up to three times actual damages um, is enough teeth in this law to um, make an aggrieved party whole and to protect the defendant in any civil action. I'm going to ask if there are any members of the public wish to weigh in on uh, the proposed amendment. Not seeing any. Uh, Senator Seberger, I have a concern with part of this. Um, uh, it's the part that strikes the language together with costs and disbursements, including reasonable attorney's fees. Um, I support changing shall to may, and as you may have gathered, I support including up to um, in there as well. Uh, but this is not an uncommon uh, provision. In fact, it's quite common 
Um, uh, the, uh, for example, in um, just want to make sure I got the right citation here. In the uh, Fair Labor Standards Act, there is a provision for cost disbursements and attorney's fees. Um, in the Minnesota False Claims Act, of which I was the chief author, um, there is a similar whistleblower recovery. Um, it, it has an optional liquidated damages, which would be double the amount of damages or treble damages. The Human Rights Act um, has this uh, language as well. In fact, I think most of the private rights of action that we have considered in the Judiciary Committee do include cost disbursements and reasonable attorney's fees in there. Um, and actually, the, uh, if we put, if we change shall to may and include up to, the may, I should ask counsel this probably, but I think the may would modify, sorry, Senator Carlson, I think would, would the may modify uh, the entire sentence all the way to the end, uh, which would leave it discretionary for cost disbursements and attorney's fees? as well as the amount of actual damages that are awarded or treble damages? Mr. Chair and members, yes, that's how I would read it. The May would modify um, the rest of that uh, sentence. And so it would be May recover reasonable attorney's fees. Okay. So I guess my interest, Senator Seberger, I'd like to see the amendment divided. Um, because I'd like to be able to vote for an amendment that stops after um, May and up to are inserted, but without the language that you propose to strike. Um, so before I ask for anyone to divide it, because I'm chairing it and I can't actually do that myself, um, I'd like to get your response, Senator Sieberger. I have no objection to that. All right. So. Then, uh, uh, Senator. All right, yeah, I so thought your question was whether I heard you wanted to divide the amendment. I have no objection to the division okay, and so, proceeding that way. Okay, so Senator Westland moves to yes, no. Yes, I don't Mr. Want Chair. To put words in your mouth, Senator Mr. Westland. Chair, I saw your head nodding, uh, so I kind of uh, I move to divide the amendment okay. as proposed. Um, all right, so Senator Westland moves to divide the amendment as is proposed. Ms. Primo, do I, we need to do anything else procedurally to consider this? Once the amendment's divided, uh, it's, it's up to the author of the amendment to decide which order we take the, uh, the votes. Um, so, okay. So, Senator Sieber, the, the, uh, all those, do, we don't have to vote on dividing the amendment. Do we? It's just it's automatically divided upon the motion. So, Senator Seberger, as the author of the amendment, you have the right to decide which order we consider the two portions of the amendment now. Which would you like to have considered first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let's take the hard part first, the stricken language, um, and we can consider that. As, as the, the committee considers the portion of the amendment dealing with the striking of the language which would make awardable costs and disbursements, including reasonable attorney's fees. I want to talk a little bit about Rule 68 of the Minnesota Rules of Civil Procedure. This provides a vehicle for parties who are in litigation to um, hold that as uh, kind of a carrot on the end of a stick when they speak to settlement. And the way Rule 68 works is when parties are in litigation, they make offers of settlement. And if they make an offer of settlement, a former offer of settlement under Rule 68 and, and frame it as such, then that settlement offer has some teeth. Then both parties have a little bit of skin in the game because the way Rule 68 reads is, let's say I'm the defendant and I offer to settle for a particular amount and the plaintiff tells me to go pound sand, I'm not gonna take your offer. And we go to trial and I, 
I do better, the plaintiff should have taken my offer, then as a defendant under Rule 68, the plaintiff has to pay my costs. If, on the other hand, the plaintiff makes an offer of settlement and the defendant does not take it, the parties go to trial and it turns out that the plaintiff, that the defendant should have taken it, it would have been a better deal, but didn't, then the plaintiff is entitled to their costs and disbursements plus an additional amount of costs and disbursements that they incurred after service of the offer. So there's, this is already built into the law and it's already built into the way things work. And it's an effective tool to foster settlement negotiations and really lean on people and parties in a lawsuit to consider settlement offers um, carefully before rejecting them out of hand. So we have this tool already. Um, it's something that is used quite a bit and I think is very effective. Therefore, I think it makes the language I'm proposing to strike as it relates to costs and disbursements unnecessary in this uh, particular bill. And then of course, you know my position on attorney's fees. Uh, so, Senator Seberger, my, my thoughts on that is that, um, you know, generally I, I agree with you that the American rule um, is a default rule. Rule 68 is a very particular tool that may or may not end up being used in litigation. Um, in fact, often it's not. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm not convinced that it's, it's a, a regularly used, meaningful, and viable alternative to putting the remedy and statute, plus the, the purpose of, of uh, uh, having cost disbursements and reasonable attorney's fees involved is, is um, I think, to, to provide for, um, to make it easier for a case to be taken by an attorney that doesn't have a client with deep pockets that can take the risk and front their fees or may owe obligations. Um, so it's kind of a, it's, in a sense, it's like a contingent fee as, a, as a, a, a key to the courthouse for people, for plaintiffs that don't have the wherewithal to, to pay a lawyer for an hourly rate to pursue such a case. Um, so I, I respect where you're coming from on this. I guess I respectfully disagree with it. And I understand that, Mr. Chair, but I would disagree with, with your characterization that Rule 68 is rarely used. In my experience, it's used in just about every case. And it's a very effective tool and something that the parties rely heavily on when it comes to, to settlement negotiations. Uh, well, for what it's worth, I'm, I'm going to respectfully oppose um, the motion to adopt part two or the the part of the amendment that's before us right now. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I'm sure Senator Klein has also been reaching out to the um, to Senator Port, the author on this bill, and, and just want the committee to be aware of the fact that in my communications with her, she actually um, is not opposed to the amendment that would delete cost and disbursements and reasonable attorney's fees. And for what it's worth, when we get to the other part of the amendment, um, she's in agreement with that as well. So the original author of the bill does not oppose um, the uh, amendment that Senator Seeberger has offered. Is there any further discussion on the portion of the amendment that's before the committee right now? Uh, not seeing any, the question will occur then uh, whether the uh, members are in favor of the portion of the amendment that deletes the language that is proposed to be deleted. All those in favor of that portion of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. All right, that portion of the amendment is adopted. Uh, now, um, the amendment is as it stands uh, in uh, a full. Um, why don't we have uh, 
Ms. Primo read to us the amendment as it now appears in front of the committee for consideration. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair, in addition to what's currently in the A3, um, page 3, line 17, after recover, insert up to, delete comma together, page 3, line 18, delete everything before the period. Senator Seberger, just to be clear, is that the form of the amendment that you wish for us to consider right now? Uh, yes, and it also, I don't know that I heard the, the language, well, the um, 3.17, the shell being a mace, so that's also, that's the printed part. Yeah, right. Correct. Okay, is there any further discussion on the amendment as it now stands? Not seeing any. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Is there any further discussion on Senate File 6? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just I'm sorry. I'm going to back up for a second because Senator Carlson had had his hand up earlier and I jumped oh, over him did, to Senator huh? Seberger. <laughs> so I apologize, Senator Limmer. I miss Senator Carlson. I apologize, Senator Carlson, for doing so. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You may regret that, but uh, <laughs> uh, I have That's a, a good question. start, Senator Carlson. <laughs> I, I know. I, I have a question that is might change some of the uh, appearance of this bill a bit. My my question is: How are new sellers and new resellers uh, brought into the behaviors described in this law, and how is the average pricing established in order to establish price gouging? for someone who comes into this new. And maybe I'll use a, a silly hypothetical. Uh, when a, a night, uh, a, a late night show person says that we need to buy all the toilet paper, and then suddenly the toilet paper uh, shows get emptied and uh, the price goes up and there are people gouging uh, on selling toilet paper. Uh, the other example is, what if we all need uh, masks and so suddenly uh, everybody is out there selling masks, all kinds of mom and pop organizations that are buying them from uh, dark suppliers that, uh, like that mask. yeah, like, well, yeah, so I, I, I have a, an assistant here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mask. <laughs> and uh, suddenly we had uh, people selling masks at greatly uh, exaggerated prices and respirators as well. Now, here's where you get into my wheelhouse because this is what I did for many years, is I worked on masks and I worked on respirators and they are two different products. And they're very different in their approval, in their performance and in their prices. And so if uh, anyone here has worn a K95, KN95, respirator, that's a respirator, that's not a mask, a KN95, you've been wearing a counterfeit because KN95 is approved only in the Asia Pacific. The K stands for Korea. We have NIOSH as our approval agency here. And the, the companies that make these respirators that are NIOSH approved and anyone that's in uh, medicine or nursing, they know what a, a N95 is because they get tested in them and their employer mandates that they wear an N95. Uh, those are, are uh, NIOSH approved and they have a number on them that usually starts with a TC and that number can, is used for medical traceability just like a pharmaceutical. You can go back to the manufacturer, the plant, the time, the shift, and the operator of that machine that made that product. You cannot do that with a mask. So Be Senator Carlson, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, but your question is clearly on a topic outside the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. And while I, okay. I want our members to be well informed about the bills before us, um, we have a long agenda with stuff just before the Judiciary Committee's jurisdiction. So could you please get specifically I, I to your question? I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. But Thank you. The, you know, we've got, you know, I have explained this so many times I'm blue in the face. And what we have is so many, so much price gouging on false, falsely uh, um, labeled respirators 
that the amount of gouging has probably cost the, the state billions. Yeah, and in the case of going online and buying respirators, and you buy a respirator for 10 bucks a piece uh, it, that says KN95 on it, you're buying a counterfeit. And the fact is that it, this, is, this is small business people that are coming in and they're price gouging the public. And that's where, and I've talked to uh, council here to see if we can put something in there that uh, will say that in, uh, on line 211, where we talk about seller, I'm sorry, uh, the unconscionably excessive price means a price that represents a gross disparity compared to the seller's average price of an essential good or service. And what we need to do is we need to put something in there that takes care of these people that are jumping into the market just because they can, just because they see a, an opportunity for people to overpay for an essential product that they think meets the standards of what you what you need to wear when you go out into public, or you know, uh, and they're mislabeling respirators as masks and masks as respirators. So it's uh, we need to make sure that people know what they're buying, and also know what the normal price is. Now I worked on the machines that make these products. Uh, I worked on a respirator machine, and I know how much these cost. And so I know that it's a massive gouge that we're dealing with here. So, um, Senator Klein, do, do we have something that uh, we can put in to make sure that we catch the people that are taking advantage of this? So, well, Senator Klein, before you respond, um, this is very close, if not completely outside of the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. It would probably have to go back to Commerce unless the Chair of Commerce Committee waived it if we were to weigh in and adopt an amendment such as this, which is really Commerce's decision on how to define unconscionably excessive price. Um, I'm going to try to remain consistent here in the way I treat both sides of the, uh, of the aisle with regard to this committee's action on, on portions of bills that are not within our policy jurisdiction. So, Senator Klein, if you want to respond, uh, let us know what direction. I, I, my view has also been that if the chair of the other committee with jurisdiction says, fine, go ahead, sort it out here, and we, we, don't, uh, we don't care if you intrude, then I'm a little more open to it. But this really isn't our bailiwick. So, Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Carlson, uh, so if you'll grant me a little latitude and speak in the, in the role that I have as a Commerce Chair, uh, to Senator Carlson's specific scenario where somebody jumped into the market and began selling masks, they wouldn't have had a record of 60 days of prior sales to, from which to base a baseline uh, pay. Uh, two, two points to that. First, I think that would be a small minority of all sellers, uh, and the bill would cover the vast majority of what we're trying to treat here. Secondly, those sellers, let's say they were going at twice uh, market value, uh, would be undermined by usual sellers, Walmart, Target, et cetera, who were selling masks uh, and were under the jurisdiction of this law. So I think it's covered. I would not support an amendment that would try to change the definitions, and I would not ask for it back to my committee. Senator Carlson. I guess the only, the only response, uh, Mr. Chair, would be that uh, this kind of allows of the, uh, takes away the impact of the bill. And uh, I have to say that uh, there are some large companies that are being impacted by this on the other side. Uh, for instance, my history is I was involved in this particular product, uh, respirators, for many years at 3M. And I know that 3M put out a, an edict that they will not sell to, you know, first of all, you can't go to a 3M store. There's no such thing to go to a 3M store and buy a respirator. So they distribute with what's called distribution. And uh, they put out a, a notice that anyone that's price gouging of their products, they will suspend their contract with that price gouger and not sell to them. And that's why you did not see 3M respirators at 10 bucks a piece, because 3M pulled that, uh, uh, that supply chain. And at the time, 3M was dealing with uh, 
counterfeit respirators and uh, counterfeit you know, people that would not only put 3M's name on it, but also would use the 3M number as the approval. And about three months after we started using respirators, 3M had a thousand lawsuits that were being prosecuted against the, uh, uh, these counterfeiters. And they were being made all over the world and brought into the U.S. All right, Senator Carlson, I'm going to give you the same choice I gave Senator Howell at a previous committee when he sought to introduce a number of amendments that were outside our committee's jurisdiction. We can take it up for a vote right now. I'm going to oppose it. Or you can withdraw the amendment. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I have not made an amendment yet. I was asking for uh, oh. our counsel to provide something. I'm sorry. I thought then... Uh, let me ask if you wish to make an offer an amendment at this time. I've already telegraphed my approach to it. Um, <laughs> Senator Carlson. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm hoping that we came up with a very, very simple amendment, and I'd ask uh, counsel if they have done that. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would only support it if it is a simple amendment. Senator Carlson, counsel's not quite ready with language, so we're going to move on right now, and you can talk with counsel about the language she's working on, and you can decide how you'd like to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, getting back to the bill before us, um, I had a concern about uh, line uh, 224. Um, this makes reference to ab abnormal market disruption, and uh, it makes reference to a governor, governor may, by executive order, declare an abnormal market disruption. And uh, I'm just concerned, you know, in the last few years, due to the COVID pandemic and the emergency response, emergency powers of the governor, are we now, uh, is this a new uh, authority that we're giving to the executive branch, to the, to the governor? I was wondering if someone could give me that information. Senator Klein, Senator could Klein. you tell me? Mr. Chair and Senator Limmer, and, and I can have counsel speak to this as well, but uh, as I understand it, it would be sort of a sub. Uh, first, the first uh, barrier to pass with the uh, state of emergency would have to be declared. So that is within existing powers. Um, and then there would have to be a subsequent executive order declaring an abnormal market dis disruption sort of as a function of that state of emergency. So uh, I'm not sure it's an expansion of powers. I think it's a, a subsection within the state of emergency. Well, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Lemmer. Uh, I, going down to line 31, page 2, 31, uh, the declaration can terminate 30 days after the date that it was created, but... Um, if you remember, um, the last emergency order by the executive branch, it continued on and on, and it needed um, legislative uh, action to stop it. And in a divided government, that did not occur. Uh, how does it, how does the legislature, is the legislature involved to prevent a governor from every 30 days reactivating uh, this declaration. Mr. Chair. Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer, uh, as I read the language, unless he reactivates the state of emergency, uh, he would not be empowered to reactivate the executive order declaring an abnormal market disruption. Mr. Chairman, press Senator question Limmer. to counsel is more appropriate. Um, what is the, uh, how is, how is an uh, emergency declared by a governor, uh, how does it either get reactivated or how does it end uh, with the participation of the legislature? I know, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, it's a fast curveball I'm throwing, but it's important to know the context of this portion of the bill. Senator Limmer, counsel is uh, considering your question. Yeah. Take just a moment.
asked. Senator Limmer. Uh, why the council is digging for uh, reference, um, I did want to question whether or not on line 25, the um, abnormal market disruption would be executed or would be defined or declared based on a substantial and atypical change in the market. And um, perhaps uh, Senator Klein could tell me how that would be defined. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, Senator Limmer. I, I, I think, first of all, I will acknowledge that those are imprecise terms. However, I think when you get to uh, the language that defines what a, the language at 2.16 that defines what uh, an excessive price is not, I think that provides some comfort um, around market disruptions uh, and some clear expectations on the part of retailers as to, as to what is a change. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Lemmer. Uh, on line 16, that may end the subparagraphs one through four is telling us what is part of the definition of what it is not of uh, the reference or the definition of on line 11, unconscionably excessive price. And uh, a qualifier on 14 after the period says none of the following is unconscionably excessive price. And then it makes reference to line 16, but it doesn't make a reference to what is a substantial and atypical change in the market. So in my opinion, it gives the governor quite a bit of leeway to define it himself. And like I said before, there's quite a consternation in the last few years uh, of exactly that. And so um, to me, I, I would think that would need another definition to uh, make sure we set proper parameters for the executive branch to make such a decision. So members, I'm going to let this conversation go on for five more minutes, and if this bill is not done, we're going to lay it over so we can get on to other items on the agenda. Mr. Chair. Senator uh, Klein, Senator Limmer, uh, do you have a specific question, or is uh, this just a comment on the bill? I'm, I'm just going to make a comment, Mr. Chair, that um, I'm raising an issue that doesn't appear to have an answer, and so there's no need for any further discussion unless the committee wants to uh, uh, expand on it. Just bringing it up, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lemmer. Senator Westland. All right, Senator Carlson, circling back to you, how do you wish to proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, council has prepared an amendment uh, that uh, should capture the, uh, the issues of, a, of a, a new entry into the market uh, and for the purposes of gouging the, the public. So perhaps uh, the Senate Council can provide the number of the amendment and the wording. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, it will be an oral amendment. Um, I don't have a written amendment drafted and I can read that whenever everyone is ready. Go ahead, Ms. Primo. Um, Mr. Chair and members, page Two, line 14, after the period, insert, unconscionable, unconscionably excessive price includes a price that represents a gross disparity between the seller's price of the essential good or service compared to the average price of the good or service in the current market. Mr. Chair, I, Senator Carlson. I think that's a perfect amendment. Thank you. And I may make the motion to uh, uh, to Senator adopt Senator Carlson that amendment. moves that language as an amendment. Senator Klein. Uh, Senator Latz and uh, Chair Latz and Senator Carlson. 
I think there are definitions within that amendment which would be under the purview of the Commerce Committee. Um, average market price, I think I heard, uh, and uh, would need the wisdom and insight of that committee. I would respectfully request that this committee vote this amendment down and that if such uh, an addition to this law is required, that Senator Carlson drop a new Senate file uh, that would address this issue. And Senator Klein, if this amendment goes on, you're going to request that it be re-referred back to Commerce Committee for a review? Uh, that would be under consideration, Mr. Chair. Is there any further conversation or discussion relating to Senator Carlson's uh, proposed amendment? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll make it very quick. I, I have concerns with <clears throat> gross disparity, that term, what it means, how that's workable for retailers um, or even people that are entering the market. That's it's not a precise term, and then I'll leave my comment at that. I mean, I know it's, I guess it's already in the bill, but it wasn't within our jurisdiction before, and now we're being asked to comment on it. So that's my comment. Thank you. Any further discussion on Senator Carlson's amendment? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The amendment does not prevail and is not adopted. To the bill, is there any further discussion? Senator Limmer. Uh, real quick, uh, Council gave some suggested language on line 2.27, and I'll have Council explain the amendment. We've got about two minutes, Senator Limmer, and I'm laying the bill over if it's not done by then. I'll request Council speak quickly. <laughs> Mr. Chair and members, um, I believe this would be a clarifying amendment um, in line with perhaps the intent of the author. It's page two, line 27, after governor insert under chapter 12. My understanding is that in that initial state of emergency would be something that, that, that um, takes place um, pursuant to the powers in chapter 12. So, members, I am informed that this committee does have jurisdiction to review questions under Chapter 12. Uh, so, it is within our purview. Senator Klein, what is your thought on this amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Primo, again, the amendment would just be the words under Chapter 12 added at 2.27. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Ms. Klein, Primo. yes, after Governor. Mr. Chair, I have no objection to the amendment. Ms. Primo, are there any other forms of state of emergency that could be declared by the governor that are outside of Chapter 12? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of a framework outside of Chapter 12 for a governor's declaration, but I, that's not a chapter I'm very familiar with, but I can clarify if, um, since we're still Senate. in committee the rest of the day. Senator Klein, is, was the original intent of this bill to fit within declarations of the state of emergency under Chapter 12, so this would be more in the nature of a clarifying amendment? Chair Latz, that is correct. This would be a clarifying amendment for what the intent of the bill is. Council has informed me they believe that Chapter 12 is the only chapter under which the governor can declare emergencies, so this would be technical and clarifying language, it appears. Uh, any further discussion in connection with uh, Senator Limmer's amendment? Not seeing any. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Any further discussion on Senate File 6? I'm not seeing any. Senator Pappas. Madam Chair. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, I would move I've been called that. all sorts of things, Madam <laughs> Chair. Probably, probably more after this bill than before. So. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'd move that Pappas. Senate file six as amended be recommended to pass, and I believe it goes to the floor. 
Senator Pappas moves that Senate File 6 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Klein. Thank you, committee. Now, I'm going to be called even worse things after this now, but we do have some people that have uh, driven from way out of the metro area to be here for the survivorship bill. Um, and uh, they're going to need to have time to drive back today, which means we're going to change the order of the agenda and we're going to take up Senate file 997 at this time. And I apologize. I see a lot of people here for the ERA bills, but I'm going to have to respect those who have come here from uh, long distances um, for this matter. Um, so, and because I'm the chief author, I'm going to hand the gavel over to Senator Umu Verbaten. Senate file 997. Senator Latz, we have Senate File 997 before us. Whenever you're ready, you may begin. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Senate File 997 um, has been around the legislature for quite some time now. Um, I, I first want to recognize my co-authors on the bill, Senators Abler, Hoffman, Frentz, and Diedzik, and in particular want to note uh, appreciation to Senator Diedzik, who was the chief author on this bill for a number of years. Uh, she now having a new position in the legislature. Uh, I've uh, taken over as chief author of this bill. Uh, the main reason for this bill is so that people uh, within, the, within the tort system in the area of injury law, under Minnesota law, which is, by the way, the only state in the nation that does it this way, um, if a uh, person is injured by another party um, and they die before any, in any legal action that has been uh, taken is concluded, then their cause of action or their ability to seek uh, accountability for the injury they received that they allege was caused by someone else dies with them. Um, and that means that the tortfeasor, the person that is alleged to have caused the injury or the death, in the case of a wrongful death action, um, would not be held accountable for the injuries that they are thought to have caused. Um, and indeed, it creates a perverse incentive within the tort system for the alleged tortfeasor the causer of the injury to delay resolving a case long enough um, so that the claimant dies before the case is concluded. <clears throat> um, now, that seems to me to be um, against all of the purposes of a tort system. The purpose of a tort system is where uh, it is to hold accountable those who cause injury or death and to create the financial incentives for those who are in a position to prevent such injury or death to take the steps and indeed incur costs as they may be necessary to prevent such injuries or death. That's the whole underlying theory of the tort system. Uh, 
So as to any individual cases that come up, of course, those are subject to all of the protections within our civil justice system uh, as they play out. Um, but to overcome this perverse incentive to delay a case until after a person dies of, of another cause, um, we, I'm proposing that we take this action uh, to indicate that a cause of action survives the death of any party. Um, for that purpose, then, we offer Senate File 997, um, and we have some testifiers uh, to support that position. Senator Latz, did you want to move an amendment before that? Um, I think before uh, we do that, I'd, I'd like to have uh, the testifiers um, testify. I think they're going to address some concerns that the amendment would also address. Okay, thank you, Senator Latz. Um, up first, we have uh, Toby Pearson. Uh, oh, and Joel Carlson, if you want to, you can begin. Um, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Joel Carlson. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice. I'll be exceedingly brief. We appreciate your consideration of this bill. Uh, it is a problem, and we are the only state in the union with a statute, 57301, that mandates that your cause of action dies with you when you die from an unrelated cause. And we would love to see the legislature uh, address this. It's passed off the Senate floor twice, and we appreciate Senator Dietzik's laboring on this issue. And Senator Limmer and I had a discussion about that, and we were both right. Senator Limmer, you voted against it once and for it once. So uh, we were both right when we talked in your office. Uh, Minnesota is not a litigious state. Uh, we have uh, very few um, uh, personal injury cases in Minnesota, around 2,000 cases. That's down over 50% over the last decade. Uh, we're not a litigious society, uh, but we want to be uh, respectful and fair. We've had very positive conversations with people who have concerns about this bill, and Senator Latz is going to bring forward an amendment that addresses one of them. How long would these cases be able to be filed? And we're going to continue those conversations uh, with people that have concerns about this. We know they address these cases in every single state. Uh, and we would like to see people have justice uh, in Minnesota as well. And you'll hear from some people who have been impacted negatively by this law. So I'm going to leave it at that and have Mr. Slane, our president, uh, seek your support as well. And then when you're done with testimony, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. I appreciate you being brief. Um, we'll move to Chuck Slane. If you can state your name, title for the record, and then please keep it brief. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chuck Slane, and I'm here as the president of the Minnesota Association for Justice. Uh, this bill has been and remains the top priority of our organization. It's time for Minnesota to adopt the right of survivorship, and we urge uh, that you vote uh, it forward today, and uh, we will be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Slane. A Senator Latz, do you have a preference on which testifiers come next? Thank you. Please state your name uh, and title for the record and uh, keep the testimony brief. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Well, I guess, I guess it's not afternoon. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Heather Meyer, um, and um, I am here to share the story of my husband and I um, in regards to this legislation and this bill. Um, my husband and I have been married for 30 years, and his name is Joel Meyer. Uh, we live in Niswa. Joel is a veteran. Um, he served in the U.S. Navy uh, during the Vietnam conflict. 602 days ago, Joel underwent surgery to his colon and his liver as a result of a stage 4 cancer diagnosis in January of 2021. The cancer recurred in the spring of 2022, and it recurred again this past winter. He just finished his most recent round of chemotherapy, 
and that's why he's not with us today. The chemo has left him too debilitated to make the six hour round trip. So I am here today to share our story with you in the hope that it will pre prevent others from going through the same thing. The sickness, the chemo, the doctor visits, and the constant fear and anxiety about what comes next have been hard, but it was made needlessly harder by a mistake that was made during surgery on July 9th of 2021. During surgery, the hospital staff and surgeons failed to account for all of the surgical sponges, despite the lead surgeon leaving a note in her report stating that all instrument and sponge counts were correct. They were not. A 12 by 12 sponge was left inside of his abdomen, and that is a sponge the size of a dish rag. I brought him home from Duluth on the 20th of July, and I called an ambulance on the 22nd of July. The sponge was discovered on the 23rd, and it was removed on the 24th. In the two week period that it was in his abdomen, it created multiple infections and complications, he remained hospitalized until fall, the 17th of September. During that time, he went from 199 pounds to 150. My, hun my husband is six foot three. He was delirious. He developed sepsis and nearly died. He couldn't keep food or anything else down. And he was depressed. He underwent surgery after surgery to insert drains in his abdomen to drain abscesses that had been left behind by the infections from the sponge that was floating around in his abdomen. His recovery lasted months and months, even after he came home. I had to feed him through tubes inserted in his belly four times a day, every three hours. I ran out of paid, paid time off and subsequently, I ran out of money. To make matters worse, the hospital provider did not seem to care. In a meeting initiated by them with their CFO and their several other officers and their risk management officer, they apologized and offered me two $10 gift cards to accommodate the inconvenience of driving 20 minutes from our home to be with him at the hospital every single day from the 21st of July to the 17th of September. So we hired a lawyer. At the time, we did not want to litigate, and we still don't. We are not litigious people. We have never sued anyone in our entire lives. We don't want to spend these valuable days sitting through depositions and responding to ridiculous discovery and spending money on medical experts. At this time, they are getting ready to depose us the end of this month. We are hopeful, we were hopeful that we could negotiate a fair settlement with them. We made them an offer and they didn't even bother to respond to our offer. It was radio silence. As a result, we had to start a lawsuit. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I can read a pleading. In their answer to our lawsuit, they denied any negligence at all, and they even stated that my husband may have been negligent and that he might have been the cause of his injuries. Keep in mind, he was in their care 24-7 from the 9th of July to the 17th of September, except for one day. 21st of July of 2021. They have now asked for a jury trial, and they have even asked that we pay for their costs. The trial has been set for just after Thanksgiving, which should be the beginning of our holiday season, and it will infringe on our holiday season. In my mind, there is only one reason for the hospital to refuse to negotiate to include ridiculous defenses and to ask for a jury trial, and that is that they are hoping he will die from cancer before they can be held accountable for their negligence. They have all of his medical records. They know that he has stage four cancer, and they know that under current law, 
that if he were to pass before we can hold them accountable, they don't have to pay a single penny for the harm that they caused. So I am here to ask you to help us fix this terrible legal loophole that lets wrongdoers profit from the deaths of their victims. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meyer, for your testimony. And my heart really goes out to you, Thank your you. husband, your entire family for all that you've been through. Thank you. Senator Latz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Meyer, you're welcome. for your travel today as yes, well, you're welcome. for being here. Our best to your husband. All right, thank you. Um, uh, members, uh, I would like to call your attention uh, to a number of uh, items in your packets as well. Um, there is, uh, among a number of individual letters, some uh, people uh, supporting this, uh, there's also a letter from the Elder Voice Advocates. Um, that's in there, and I note that there is a letter in opposition as well, so I'm being fair-minded, letting you know what's there. Um, you also have in your packet um, information uh, describing the number of uh, kinds of claims that are filed in uh, Minnesota courts, um, and uh, you will note that with regard to personal injury and wrongful death claims, uh, not only are they a fairly small proportion of all claims in Minnesota courts, but they have been declining substantially um, in, in the last uh, uh, four or five years. Um, there's a graphic uh, which describes or which shows Minnesota being the only state that has this kind of provision. Um, and uh, and uh, there's some other information in there as well for you to take a look at as you're able to do so, as well as an article reproduced from the Star Tribune on um, uh, the subject. Um, I do have the uh, A1 amendment that I would like to offer as an author's amendment, and this does change the statute of limitations, as Mr. Carlson described um, uh, following his conversations uh, with regard to uh, people of interest or stakeholders uh, in the bill. The change would be that um, uh, ordinarily, uh, the default statute of limitations for personal injury claims in Minnesota is six years um, from the uh, 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 date of occurrence. Um, and uh, this would change the statute of limitations to be three years after the date of death, as provided uh, that the action will still be commenced within six years. So it doesn't change the six years from the act or omission. But also, in the event that there is an intervening death, it provides a three-year limitation for bringing the cause of action as well. And so I, I'd uh, move the A-1 amendment as an author's amendment. Okay. Uh, Senator Latz has moved the A-1 amendment as an author's amendment. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The uh, amendment is adopted. Senator Latz, you have um, a few more testifiers. Um, whoever wants to start, um, please state your uh, name and title for the record and as much as you can keep the testimony brief. Okay, thank you. My name is Jackie Hennessy and I'm here to share the experience of our family in support that this bill would be passed. My support is based on the tragedy of my family's experience and the belief that no family should ever have to repeat this experience. In June 2014, my mother at the age of 79 was the victim of a witnessed sexual assault at the facility where she lived. The assault occurred at the hands of another resident who was not removed from the facility for another six days after our family got an order for protection. In the following days, weeks, and months after the assault, our family engaged in multiple legal actions in an attempt to provide safety for my mother and to bring justice on her behalf. Initially, we were met with roadblocks and lack of support, which were explained away by her age, her cognitive status, and details of the assault. The actions of our attorney to the responsible parties after we finally connected with attorneys specializing in elder abuse their actions were met with delayed response or no response over months and months until my mother's death in May 2016. Because this case was never brought to closure in the courts of law during the life of my mother, the case 
essentially died with her. She lived the last two years of her life suffering with the memory of a sexual assault and the fear that it would happen again. When we tucked her in at night, she would ask us if her windows were locked. The negligence of the facility was never acknowledged. No one was held responsible. No one was held accountable. No authentic apology was ever given to my mother or my family. My mother was not given the dignity of care deserving of victims of sexual assault. With her death, her pain and suffering was immediately forgotten. As we've heard, Minnesota is the only state to not have claims survive the death of the individual. I am asking you to vote to not forget the pain and suffering of fam families and victims. I am asking you to vote to hold responsible parties accountable for the pain and suffering of victims and their families. I am asking you, please, to vote in support of this bill so that there is no incentive to drag out claims, hoping that the death of the victim closes a case rather than the justice of the courts. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, sorry for your loss, and again, um, sorry to hear all the difficulty that your family experienced in those those last few months. Um, to our next testifier, if you could state your name and title for the record, and um, try to keep the testimony brief. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Kay Bromelkamp. I urge you to support Senate File 997, critical legislation for our elder population. I'm a founding member of Elder Voice Advocates, our members share experiences of abuse, neglect, pain, suffering, injury, and death of our loved ones in long-term care with no recourse under the law for harm when their claims die with them. Under the current law at, at Minnesota Statutes 573.01 and .02, justice for loved ones who are injured or died due to negligence is unattainable. The law operates as a disincentive for quality care. Pre-pandemic, my mother resided in York Gardens of Edina Assisted Living for care related to her dementia and experienced ongoing neglect and abuse leading to injury and death. She shared comments with us that we just attributed to her dementia, such as, they are mean to me. I wasn't fed and I was hungry. I don't know how I got this bruise. There's a man that sleeps in my chair at the end of my bed. When we brought our concerns to the staff, we were repeatedly told that the care was checked off on her chart, so therefore it must have been done. We had our own observations that led us to put in a camera. Unexplained bruises, unshowered at times, unchanged depends, safety sensors unplugged, finding our mom alone in a room while all the residents were eating. Many mornings still in bed, no cares given. In a three-day span of time, from camera record, we observed night safety checks skipped, no showers, no medications, skipped escorts to meals. The morning aide would come in, lock the door, go to the end of her bed, sit in a chair, watch TV or sleep. That was the man at the end of my mom's bed that she had told us about. And not provide her cares or prepare a breakfast or bring her to breakfast. Another aide dressed her roughly, stating she's being rough with her because my mom is so frustrating. And repeatedly hits our mom legs, hits my mom's legs, then yelled at her calling her a grown ass adult multiple times. Our family would come most days to help protect our mother and to care for her. On three different occasions, when the facility knew that we had a camera, no cares were given for 16, 18, and 19 hours each. She lay in her own soil with no food, water, or change of depends. We reported the neglect and abuse of our mother to the Minnesota Department of Health. While we waited for the state to investigate, our, mothers, our mother suffered staff retaliation, the maltreatment continued, and she passed away. Based on our submission, the findings were substantiated maltreatment and neglect. However, the substantiation came too late five months after her death. We later learned that, that during the investigation, the facility had previously submitted their own report that falsely reported the severity of the abuse my mother endured. Even a small measure of accountability, the administrative processes is extremely hard to achieve. Criminal claims are out of the control of families and are extremely rare against care providers, even with egregious abuse and neglect. Families are left with a civil process only to find out the claims of horrific pain and suffering of their loved ones due to negligence leading to injury and death died with them. The facility makes it very difficult for families to get any resolution while living and even more so after death. The facilities are not held accountable. We contemplated a legal claim of injury and death after our mother died 
and were devastated to learn that we could not bring claims on her behalf. Instead, reduced to a claim of fraud for collecting a fee for services never delivered. We are the only state not to allow claims to survive. The time has come to change the law. Our growing elder population needs this change. They are significantly and disproportionately disadvantaged by the current lack of survivability from the rest of our population, given their advanced age, their vulnerabilities, limited lifespan, and likelihood of death after injury. There currently is no justice for their harm, for their pain, for their suffering. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share my support. Thank you for your testimony. Sorry for your, your loss and, again, the abuse that your mother endured in the facility. Uh, we do have three more um, folks signed up to testify. Toby Pearson, Aaron um, Hubbard, me, Penny Saylor. Uh, if you could come forward. Mr. Pearson, if you could state your name uh, and title for the record, and uh, please try to keep the testimony brief. Uh, Madam Chair, members, my name is Toby Pearson. I'm with Care Providers of Minnesota today on behalf of the Long-Term Care Imperative. Uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Hubert for the second half of our testimony. First, I'd like to say thanks to the proponents for taking the time to meet with us and explain their intent. Found that conversation to be very helpful, I think, to trying to arrive at what we hope will be a future uh, resolution of our differences. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Unfortunately, our settings deal with death and dying almost every day, and the process of dying is never easy. Our settings, and especially our hardworking staff, have had to deal with this enormously in the last two years. Unfortunately, incidents like those that were described do happen. Stories like those illustrate why we do need to come together, why we do need to talk to the author and the proponents, and that we do need to solve this issue. We've not reached agreement with the language in its current form, uh, or even including the um, amendment that you took today. We still have concerns about timing of the filing of suits and logistics of that timing. It's a pretty complex issue once you deal, delve into the complexities of the laws. On its face, the stories illustrate why this needs to be addressed. We look forward to ongoing conversations with the author and the proponent and hope that we can find some language that will address our concerns before it is acted upon on the floor. I will turn it over to Ms. Hubert now. Ms. Hubert, you can state your name and title for the record. Please try to keep the testimony brief. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Erin Hubert, and I am here on behalf of a long-term care imperative. Um, I don't have the distinction of being a lawyer. I am a regular person, so my comments will reflect that. Um, and I'm actually going to take things a slightly different direction. Um, I had a very close and important member of my family pass in May of 2020. This person had been ill for a while, um, but things really took a turn in March of that year. So three years later, there is still a lot that I remember pretty vividly about that time. I remember the smell of my mask and how it itched because it was fabric and it was so early in the pandemic that that's all we had at the time. I remember um, that we wanted to spend time with her, but we were really worried about meeting with her and perhaps giving her this virus that no one knew anything about and accelerating her decline. I remember the call we got when she had passed during the night. I remember how absurd it felt trying to keep a mask on because we had to go through this comedic cycle of clearing our nose and wiping our tears and then washing our hands and then putting the mask back on and then clearing our nose and washing our hands and putting the mask back on. <laughs> And it felt like a slapstick comedy. I remember how we had to have a, grave, a graveside service that left out people that were really important to her because we were still pretty limited on how many individuals could gather at one time. I know that we were making the best decisions we could with the information we had. And here's what I don't know and what I don't remember. I don't know or remember on any given day how much pain she was in in those final months. 
she was a pretty stoic person anyway, and so she probably wouldn't have let on even if she had. And my, mem my family member received really excellent, incredibly compassionate care during her illness. She passed peacefully and on her own terms. But in an alternate universe, even under this bill with the adoption of the A1, the committee would be asking a court to rely on me and my memory, as imperfect as it is, to attest not to my own pain, but to hers. And that perhaps is why Minnesota has never rewarded people who have not been directly injured with money for another person's claims. So as my colleague said, you know, the organizations who have concerns with Senate File 997, even with the A1 adopted, um, we remain opposed at this time, but we do hope to, make, uh, to reach a resolution so that when it comes before the floor, um, we can address where everyone's concerned. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, Amy Penny Saylor, our last testifier. Please come forward, state your name and title for the record, and try to keep the testimony brief. May it please the chair and members of the committee, my name is Amy Penny Saylor. I'm an attorney at Alina Health, and I'm here today on behalf of Minnesota Hospital Association. Um, we are opposing the bill as written today. Um, with all due respect to um, Senator Latz, uh, the stated purpose that he provided in the beginning is narrower than the bill is written right now. It's much more broad um, as written. Uh, and with all due respect, of course, to the family stories and, and to families, um, you know, this committee, of course, and the legislature uh, in general has to consider not only these family stories, but the public implications to health care and health care costs. Um, this bill as written is incredibly broad. It poses significant impact to Minnesota doctors, nurses, and hospitals. Uh, families of decedents do recover from medical negligence through wrong wrongful death claims. Uh, this bill as written would allow families and their attorneys a double recovery at the expense of further straining strapped healthcare systems, reducing community health care services, increasing health care costs, and subjecting more doctors and nurses to lawsuits. And I do want to be clear on that point. Hospitals don't provide testimony and defend care. That falls on doctors and nurses, and not just the doctors and nurses who are accused of negligence, but the entire care team. Uh, there's been much talk about Minnesota being the only state without this bill. What is important to know is the bill as written today is broader than any other state's uh, survivorship bill. It allows for sweeping malpractice litigation without any sort of protection in place. Uh, one example of protection would be liability caps. The bill also ignores significant evidentiary concerns like hearsay and speculation. It would put judges in a bind between effectuating the statute and abiding by the rules of evidence. There is also little to no legal guidance on who may be appointed as a trustee. This bill as written today would allow an estranged family member to bring a claim on behalf of a decedent who chose not to pursue a claim. Uh, medical malpractice insurance will cost more, particularly for higher risk specialties such as OBs, which will further exacerbate Minnesota's ability to attract providers and retain services across all of Minnesota, including outstate Minnesota. Self-insured healthcare systems will be forced to divert more resources to litigation costs, which will affect overall care delivery. A bill of this scope will further weaken the financial position of healthcare systems, um, accelerating risk of consolidation, merger, and sale. In sum, uh, families in Minnesota do have a mechanism for recovering when a loved one dies due to negligence. We ask you to oppose this legislation as written because it prioritizes double recovery for those families over Minnesota doctors, nurses, and community health care services. We also look forward to the opportunity to continue to collaborate. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Latz, did you um, have any additional comments you wanted to make before we go to discussion? Uh, yes, uh, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't write fast enough to keep up with all of the parade of horribles that were just presented to the committee about what might happen if this bill is passed. But the ones I was able to, to uh, capture, um, I will make a couple of notes. Uh, one is, um, we're not claiming uh, it, 
the way the bill is written, the, the point of this is not to preserve wrongful death actions against the causer of the death. The point of this is to set up the system so that a person who dies from an unrelated cause is still able to pursue accountability for the injuries that uh, they suffered. So in the case of a long-term care facility where you've got an elderly person who they know is within six months of death from old age, or they believe is within six months of death from old age, but they're assaulted in the facility, all the defendant has to do is drag the lawsuit out for more than six months, the person dies, and then they can't be held accountability for the assault that occurred in their facility. Now, if they somehow caused the death, that is still a viable wrongful death action in Minnesota. Um, the, uh, I can't imagine um, how they get from the point of claiming there's going to be such an onslaught, onslaught of lawsuits and damages that it's going to throw the financial viability of the health care system into doubt. Um, those are the kind of arguments that have been made for decades, and I'm not kidding when I say decades. When I was in law school, I graduated in 1988. I wrote a law school paper on medical practice liability and on the compensation system. And the research that I did then has been reaffirmed since then. And uh, the research I did captured the research that was done by places like the Rand Corporation. Um, and they did comprehensive analysis of all the proposed tort reforms, liability caps, insurance changes, um, shifts the burden of proof, all those kind of things. And they try to draw a connection or look for a connection between those tort reforms and the impact on malpractice insurance premiums. And there was no impact on malpractice insurance premiums. Liability caps don't reduce insurance premiums. So this claim that malpractice insurance costs are going to skyrocket is just not supported by the evidence. If the insurance premiums skyrocket, it's going to be because insurance carriers, providers are taking advantage of a situation and raising insurance premiums. But it's not going to be because of uh, liability. The, the very occasional out of control uh, jury verdict, for example, is just so occasional that it does not have a meaningful financial or statistically significant impact um, <clears throat> on insurance premiums. Uh, so. Uh, the arguments have not changed, um, and they are as specious now as they were in 1987 when I actually wrote the paper, which, for what it's worth, was not just my own work. It, it, uh, it received an award from, uh, it was published in the Insurance Law Journal, um, so a peer-reviewed uh, uh, journal. And I don't say that to top my own credentials. I, I say it to, to uh, amplify the the value of the, the work, the, the impact of the work that, uh, uh, that it reflected. So uh, uh, members, uh, I'm always willing to continue to talk with people about improving legislation. I think I've demonstrated that over my career and in my work here on the committee this year. Um, but the underlying purpose of this bill and the underlying language in this bill is not going to create a cascade of, of uh, lawsuits and liabilities. In fact, what you have seen in terms of the detail that's in the committee packet, shows the decline um, in lawsuits. Uh, and that's not going to change with this. But it will give a, an avenue for compensation for the, the rare cases when this does happen, as you have heard, they're pretty significant situations. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Watts. Uh, members, we have Senate file 997 as amended. Before us, questions, comments? Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my uh, question is for Ms. Penny Saylor, if she could come back up to the testifying table. Um, and before the question, I mean, uh, the, the comment, I, I do think there's a need for this. Um, I'm not sure on all the parameters and whether the negotiations and whether this can get better, but there does seem to be some need 
um, to address uh, this issue. But my question for you is, you had mentioned in your testimony um, that this bill um, could lead to double recovery of damages. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of walk me through that mechanically uh, with an example of, of how this bill, passing this bill, would lead to, I'm assuming it relates to wrongful death, but if you could just kind of mechanically walk me through that and help me better understand it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. A absolutely. Uh, Ms. Penny Saylor. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, um, Chair and committee members and Senator. Um, so to be clear, the stated purpose of allowing a lawsuit to continue um, once it's been initiated, that would not implicate this double recovery concern. So the double recovery concern comes with the bill as written. And it is, you are correct, it's in the wrongful death statute. So I believe that's 573.02. Um, I hope I just gave the right site for that. Um, but it allows for, it already Minnesota allows for the family to recover for any economic losses. So, um, you know, the decedent was going to support me financially, so all of that is covered. It also allows the family to recover for um, loss of aid, companionship, support, um, so they're recovering for that. As written, this bill would also allow the family to recover for the decedent's pain and suffering. Um, and that's where now the family is not only recovering their own losses, they're also recovering for the decedent's losses. And that's different than any of the, the situations we heard from family members today. Senator Kern. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before um, I move on to a different line of questions. Maybe Senator Latz, do you, would you like to respond to that? Uh, I'm genuinely interested in this double recovery um, issue and whether, um, you know, what what your thoughts are on that. Senator Latz, yeah. Madam Chair, and Senator Kruin, it's not double recovery in the current tort system. A person who's injured is entitled to compensation if they can prove it for their economic loss and for their pain and suffering. It's a very real damage. It's a very real injury for which they are entitled to seek financial damages. You can't undo the pain they've suffered, so our system is set up to pay for that. Um, this isn't about compensating the surviving family members and what they receive. This is about justice for the injured person. And if the defendant can get out of accountability by saying, we don't feel we ought to pay for the losses, the very real losses, not only economic losses, but the, the pain and suffering for the injured person, then they've escaped liability altogether. That's why we're here. It's not a double recovery. This isn't about compensating the survivors. It's about holding accountable the tortfeasors. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I mean, I guess this went right to what, I'm, what I was asking about. I guess as I was jotting it down is, does the bill as drafted, because you're right, I mean, obviously the, in a wrongful death suit, there's the economic damages and then there's pain and suffering and both of those are necessary to make whole. Um, totally understand that, not disagreeing with that concept whatsoever. I guess my question is in the bill, and this is a genuine question, um, does the bill allow for pain and suffering for the family members? And I guess if it, and, and maybe my question should go back to Ms. Penny Saylor, and if you think it does, if you could point me to where that is. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Penny Saylor. Thank you so much. Yes, Senator. Um, the bill, uh, not only the bill, but the statute as written and enacted and in practice today allows for the family member's pecuniary losses, which includes the jury instructions call it loss of um, aid, comfort, and companionship. So, you know, my mom would have been with me at my wedding, um, and I've lost that now. So families do recover for their loss of that loved one, and that's a non-economic damage. Pain and suffering is also a non-economic damage. And again, I would just call out that 
the issue is this, it's speculative. Um, what the pain and suffering of the decedent would be, and there are evidentiary concerns, which I think would be, you know, of concern to the Judiciary Committee. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, um, current law allows for recovery of loss of consortium and aid and companionship on the part of family members. That's existing law. Um, this doesn't change that. And while there are evidentiary concerns, that's why we have courts, is to sort out the evidentiary issues. It will be harder for a plaintiff, a trustee, a family member to prove what the suffering was of their loved one that got injured. Um, so they're at a disadvantage. And a jury would sort that out. That's why we have a, a civil justice system. But this isn't changing anything. These are currently lawful categories of damages. I think Mr. Carlson would like to amplify on that. Mr. Carlson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members, briefly. Uh, Senator Kroon, if you look on the bill on page uh, 2.5, what we have been talking about is those pre-death uh, cognitive pain and suffering damages that should um, survive to the, to the family and to the estate. And that's what happens on line 2.5. But you'll notice on 2.6, those losses that Senator Latz was just talking about are already the law. So what we've been talking about for 10 years for <laughs> these cases is for all damages to survive uh, to the estate. And there isn't a double recovery uh, as we see it. And I'm happy to talk uh, with counsel and make sure I understand that concern better. Um, but this is not an outlier uh, on both of those concepts. Um, and um, so, and we're happy to detail that more, but this is not a double recovery. And you know our law prevents a double recovery. Uh, so th we know that that's not the case. And I would point out in this, in the, uh, from the Minnesota Supreme Court on the malpractice uh, side, which includes all ma malpractice attorney, accountant, medical, 109 cases filed last year across the entire state. It's a very uh, difficult area and it's a rare occurrence. Senator Kroon. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. It seems like there's some agreement on concept about that there uh, shouldn't be a double recovery and that that's the existing law. I, I understand that. Maybe there's, and I, and I won't get involved into the negotiations, maybe there is some language that could address everybody's concern, and I won't do that, uh, won't facilitate that yeah, in committee right now. Um, so I guess I'll move on to my next question, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and the, uh, and Ms. Penny Saylor had mentioned in her testimony um, that there's some issues with the appointments of personal representatives or who can carry on or bring these lawsuits and I guess my question is under this bill, um, I guess to, to her example, would, would an estranged family member be able to bring the lawsuit? Um, is there any way to tighten the language up around that? I'm just interested in your thoughts on that, Senator Latz. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, this bill does not make any changes whatsoever to the current practices and guidelines for appointing personal representatives uh, for lawsuits. So. Uh, I, I don't know how you would define who's estranged or not estranged in that regard, let alone put that in the statute. Um, so there are no changes in the law proposed uh, for that. Whatever the current law is on it would continue in force. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Carlson. Um, if you have anything to add, Ms. Penny Saylor, and then we'll go to you, Senator Kroon. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, members, uh, as we've had time to draft and redraft this proposal, we specifically did not make any changes to how a trustee is appointed. The judge makes that appointment, and that's who owns his claim. There's no uh, distant relative that gets to come in and say, I'm going to file a lawsuit. That is uh, not going to happen. That was raised as a concern, quite frankly, uh, and that's why the bill is drafted the way it is, because at one point we just repealed 57301, and that raised the question. As you see, the bill before you right now is right drafted right into that statute, and we're not making any changes there. Ms. Penny Saylor. Thank you so much. Um, I agree that as written right now, uh, an estranged family member can't bring a claim because 
the damages are tied to what that person lost. So if there's no relationship, there's no loss for that person. There is nothing, however, that prevents a trustee, a family member, an estranged daughter, for example, to bring a claim on behalf of a mother and say, my mother had pain and suffering. Now, I, I'm sure what will be said, and I agree with it, is they will have evidentiary issues. But again, as written, that, that's why the, the change, as written right now, it doesn't allow for it because it's based on a relationship. If we allow anyone to be appointed as a trustee and bring a claim, there's not that fail safe of the relationship. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. But wouldn't those issues be addressed in the appointment process, um, appointing someone as a trustee? Um, and I guess I, uh, yeah, wouldn't those concerns be able to be addressed there? Ms. Penny Saylor. Thank you so much. Yes, that might be an area to, to collaborate and talk through um, what would that mean. And I was just explaining why, as it's written now, there aren't concerns, but there could be with this bill going forward. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll, for the sake of time, I'll move on to my final point here. Um, and, you know, we've, there was some discussions about um, Minnesota being the only state and then some testimony about how Yes, but other states do it differently, and um, there's statute of limitations issues, which this uh, amendment uh, addresses to some degree. I don't know what the right number is, whether three is it or not, but that's a discussion I won't get into right now. Um, the, one, the one I wanted some, a little, someone to elaborate on a little bit more is um, uh, some states have caps on damages, and this bill doesn't have that, and so Senator Latz or... Mr. Carlson, if you could respond about why uh, some states do that or why this specifically this bill doesn't take that route. Thank you. Mr. Carlson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Senator. It's a really good question because some states do have caps principally on medical uh, malpractice damages, not on all cases. Um, but Minnesota had an experiment with caps in 1986. Uh, we, the legislature approved a $400,000 cap on non-economic damages. It was found to not do anything except for injure the most uh, severely injured people, and it was repealed in 1990. But we have a process in Minnesota on our medical negligence cases where caps generally apply that weeds out frivolous cases. We have a statute that requires pre-suit uh, review by an expert, an expert's opinion within 180 days after filing a case. And statistically, and I put this in the committee's packet, Minnesota has the lowest malpractice rates in the country, not by a little, by a lot, with, from every state that has caps on damages. And so you can't make the case that, that if we put caps on here, it will lower costs. We are already the lowest in the country without artificial limitations on what juries can provide. And so we haven't entertained the conversation on caps because we are already the lowest and we have an excellent system for making sure cases with merit can go forward and those that don't have merit don't get to the courthouse. Senator Kroon, I'll let you respond briefly, and then we're going to go to Senator Wesslin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And in the interest of time, I, um, I appreciate the conversation. Um, if, if, if Ms. Penny Saylor would like to respond to the, the caps, uh, that would be a, the final question I have, and you wouldn't have to come back to me. I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Penny Saylor. Thank you so much. I, I think the, the important part to remember on the caps is, you know, there's a, there's a narrative of Minnesota is the only state that doesn't do this. And what we wanted to point out is actually enacting the bill as written would be broader than what any other state has so that um, there are those caps in place. Senator Wesson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and um, this my question, I guess, is to Senator Latz or Mr. Carlson, but um, going to um, 573.02, this circles back and maybe just to put a fine point on who can bring an action and who can maintain the action. Um, subdivision 3 actually states the process by which someone becomes a trustee that can continue this matter. And it says upon written petition by the surviving spouse or one of the next of kin, the court having jurisdiction of an action 
falling within the provisions shall appoint a suitable and competent person as trustee to commence or continue such action and obtain recovery of damages therein. The trustee, before commencing duties, shall file a consent and oath before receiving any money. The trustee shall file a bond as, as security, therefore, in such form and with such sureties as the court may require. So again, so I don't do civil law other than family. So I'm gonna ask this question. Um, does that mean that just some random uh, person who might be estranged from the deceased could bring, it, it, I read this to say they could not bring an action, that it actually has to go through this process. Um, that sounds to me pretty rigorous. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Wesselin, one of the problems that we have with bills is that you don't get to see the rest of the law that's in front of you, but you're absolutely right. We're not changing that process at all. It happens right now, and, and, to, uh, um, and to further amplify that, if you look on page uh, one of the bill, um, uh, right now, under current law, the trustee does have the right to bring forward all other claims other than your injury action contracts and others. So that happens right now. Uh, and this just allows them to allow their injury action to survive. Thank Senator Wesson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Carlson. Uh, and again, so, so sometimes we get into these discussions and lose the nugget. So my understanding of the nugget is that an injury occurs to a person there's a cause of action that arises out of that injury. What we have heard today is that occasionally what will happen is that cause of action will be extended to the point where that person who was injured is deceased. And whatever accountability, as Senator Latz stated, may have come from bringing that cause of action is lost. This simply says that if there was, if there was a cause of action prior to the death of the person, that it will survive. Do I have that right? Um, Ms. Penny Saylor, I'll let you respond and then I'll go to Senator, uh, Mr. Carlson or Senator Latz. Senator Westland, I agree that that's been the discussion today, that that is the purpose of this bill. I disagree that as written, this bill is that narrowly tailored. Um, and if I may, just for one moment on the trustee issue, thank you for pointing out the provision in the statute. Um, it would, there are some protections, but it would still allow for um, estranged family members to bring a claim. Mr. Carlson. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We'll, we'll take that one offline because we're not really reading it that way. But uh, Senator Wesson, that's absolutely right. And the change you're talking about is on page two, line 2.23 and 2.24. We're deleting the special damages and allowing all damages to survive. That's exactly what we're here for. Thank you. Members, any other questions, comments? Can I just very briefly, Madam Senator Chair? Senator Wesson. Um, I, I will say that I am, I appreciate the testimony today from those uh, on the other side of this issue. I appreciate you participating in this discussion. I am not persuaded. And I believe that based on the stories that we have heard, that there are people who um, are experiencing significant damage, who have a, a, a right to bring a cause of action and it offends my sensibilities that there are those who would simply extend the legal process as they can, hoping that the person injured will die. And that the people who caused the injury would not be held accountable. That offends my sensibilities. And I hope that everyone will vote for this bill. May, may Members, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, Ms. Penny Saylor. Uh, members, any other questions or concerns? Um, keep that brief, and then we'll go to the author before um, moving the bill. Absolutely. Ms. Penny Saylor. That was obviously very passionate, and um, certainly families um, need to be cared for. The one thing I would say is that when a case is filed with the court, it is no longer defendant's prerogative to, quote, delay the case. A judge is in control of the case, and a judge schedules what happens with the case. Thank you. Senator Latz. Not with a closed courthouse during COVID. 
Uh, Madam Chair, boy, that just opened up a whole nother uh, <laughs> avenue. First of all, when courthouses were closed during COVID, that wasn't the case. Second of all, any civil case that gets filed is at least a year out from resolution if you go through the court process because the judge's calendars are clogged. I do a little bit of civil litigation. I just got a proposed scheduling order that sets a trial in the case for next February. Um, and that's to allow time for discovery. You just back up all the deadlines for, for motion filing, summary judgment motions, time to do depositions, everything else. You're looking at a good year. And it's very easy uh, to delay civil litigation beyond that. The, usually the judge says, let's get agreement of the parties on a scheduling order rather than imposing one like a dictator. Um, but uh, be that as it may, I read this bill much more narrowly than Ms. Saylor reads it. Um, it's very simple and clear uh, to me, um, as Senator Westland has already noted. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the whole purpose, one of the purposes of the tort system is to put financial accountability on the shoulders of the party that's in a position to prevent the harm in the first place. And if they don't feel they've got that accountability, they don't have the financial incentive, at least, to take the steps to prevent that harm, let alone getting justice for the injured party or the party's uh, survivors. It's really for the injured party. The survivors are acting on that injured party's behalf. This bill will close a gaping loophole there. And I ask for your support. Senator Latz, would you like to move the bill? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that Senate Bill 997 as amended be recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. Senator Latz moves that Senate file 997 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, the motion passes. Thank On to the next. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, we are just coming up to noon, so we are going to recess until 1230. The committee's in recess. Yeah.